Amen. So take your place there in Revelation chapter 20. That's what we're going to be um, starting out this morning. So this morning's sermon is not going to be, I always call, uh, I call the really simple sermons. A lot of times I have sermons on Sunday mornings that are talking about current events and things like that, and they're kind of simple and more fun type sermons. This is not going to be one of those, I call those gummy bear sermons. This is going to be more of a, a deep dive into the Bible um, this morning, see if we can get you uh, woken up on Sunday morning. So Revelation chapter 20, um, we've kind of studied this in the last um, few weeks. It's talking about the millennial reign of Christ. It's talking about things like the first resurrection of which we are all part of. We are all going to be part of the first resurrection, meaning we're going to get to rule and reign with Jesus in the millennial reign of Christ. And then after the millennial reign of Christ, we have the battle of Gog and Magog. And then, of course, we have the great white throne um, judgment, which is where we're going to start out um, this morning. If you look down at Revelation um, chapter 20, um, you know, we see, you know, here, and it says in verse number 12, it says, And I saw the dead small and great, stand before God, and the books were opened, and another book was opened, which is the book of life, and the dead were judged out of those things that were written in the books according to um, their work. So here we see um, in Revelation chapter 20, verse number 12, we see there's some books, and then we see a book, all right? So that's the two things you need to kind of separate in that verse. There's books, and then there's a book. The title of the sermon this morning um, is a very important um, doctrine in the Bible. We're going to go through the Bible and study it. But the title of the sermon this morning is the book of life. And what is the book of life? What is it not? Um, what's in the book? Who's in the book of life? Whose names are in it? Um, but what is it? We see in Revelation chapter 20, it's a very important book because we see that there's books. Now, that's the, the Bible, the books of the law is what those books are. And then the book is the book of life, all right? And if you look at verse number 15, you know, we use this, uh, verse number 14 and 15, we use these verses out soul winning. We see a reference again to that book, all right? So basically the way the great white throne judgment works, if you look at the end of Revelation chapter 20, it says, whosoever was not found written in the book of life was cast into the lake of fire. So basically the way the great white throne judgment works uses these books, and this book, the single book is the book of life, is that people are brought out, um, they stand, they're brought out of hell, and they stand in front of the great, great white throne judgment, and anybody that is not found in the book of life, which is anybody who's not saved, so basically anybody who's not saved, and I'll get into that, um, is going to be, anybody that's not in the book of life is going to be thrown in um, to the lake of fire, but before they're thrown into the lake of fire, they're going to be judged out of the book. All right, so basically the people that are not saved in Revelation chapter 20 in the great white throne judgment, they're judged out of, they're, they're destined for, you know, the lake of fire if they're not saved and they're not in the book of life, but they're going to be judged by the books, meaning they'll be judged by their works. They'll be judged by the books of the law. All right, look at um, Philippians chapter 4. Turn to Philippians uh, chapter 4. So we're going to look at the book of life this morning. We're going to look at what the book of life is means uh, it's mentioned many times um, throughout the Bible, but this is such an important doctrine because it speaks to the gospel, it speaks to salvation, it speaks against many false doctrines in the Bible. So turn your Bible to Philippians chapter 4, Philippians chapter 4, and let's study the book of life this morning. Let's look at the book of life what it's all about. Because look, the book of life today is used to sow a lot of confusion out there as well. But we're just going to look at what the Bible says, and you'll see how it fits perfectly in with the simplicity of the gospel. Look at Philippians chapter 4. So we have this book of life. The Bible talks about it all over in the, the Old Testament, the New Testament. We have this book of life. Who's in the book of life? Look at Philippians chapter 4. Philippians chapter 4. Look at verse number 1. The Bible says, Therefore, my brethren, dearly beloved and longed for, my joy and crown, so stand fast in the Lord, my dearly beloved. I beseech Eudeus and beseech Sintichi that they be of the same mind in the Lord. Look at verse number three. And I entreat thee also, true yoke fellow, help those women which labored with me in the gospel, with Clement also, and with my other, my, other my fellow laborers whose names are in the book of life. 
All right, so here we see that Paul um, is writing to the church in, in Philippi, and he's talking to people that are saved. All right, he's talking to the saved. So here we see that the saved are in the book of life. All right, now turn to Revelation chapter 3. So we see um, that he's talking about several saved people, fellow laborers in the gospel that are in the book of life. And you're going to keep your place in Revelation because we're going to keep going back to Revelation throughout the entire sermon. But look at Revelation chapter 3 and look at verse number 1. So Revelation chapter 2 and Revelation chapter 3 are talking about these are the letters um, that Jesus is, you know, he's writing, he's having John write to the churches. So we look at the seven churches in Revelation chapter 3, we're looking at the church of Sardis. In verse number 1, the Bible says, And the angel unto the angel of the church of Sardis write, the angel meaning um, the pastor or the messenger of that church, these things saith he that hath the seven spirits of God and the seven stars. I know thy works, that thou hast a name, that thou livest, and art dead. Be watchful, and strengthen the things which remain, that are ready to die, for I have not found thy works perfect before God. Remember, therefore, how, the, how, is, how thou hast received and heard, and hold fast, and repent. If therefore thou shalt not watch, I will come unto thee as a thief, and thou shalt not know what hour I will come upon thee. Thou hast a few names, even in Sardis, which have not defiled their garments, and they shall walk with me in white, for they are worthy. Look at verse number 5. He that overcometh, now overcometh in Revelation and other parts of the Bible, especially in Revelation, is just talking about those that are saved. Okay, He that overcometh, the same shall be clothed in white raiment, and I will not blot out his name, out of the book of life, but I will confess his name before my father and before his angels. So here the Bible is saying, we see in Philippians chapter 4 that the book of life has the names of the saved in it, and then we see in Revelation chapter 3 here that God won't blot out the saved out of the book of life, which, by the way, turn to Exodus chapter 32. You're going to keep your place in Revelation we see that names can, this implies that names can be blotted out or removed from the book of life. So we see that there's the saved in the book of life, and we see that the saved will not be removed from the book of life. But this implies in, in Revelation chapter 3 that, you know, God says, I won't blot out the saved, but that implies that somebody could be blotted out from the book of life. And the Bible backs this up. Look at Exodus chapter 32. So in Exodus chapter 32, in Exodus chapter 32, you're keeping your place in Revelation, which is kind of easy because it's the last book of the Bible. But in Exodus chapter 32, we're dealing with the situation where the Israelites have worshipped, they built the golden calves, and Moses came down from the mountain, and they're worshipping these idols, and God is mad, all right, in Exodus chapter 32. Look at verse number, um, look at verse number 32 of Exodus chapter 32. Verse number 32. Now look, this shows like what a great advocate for the people Moses was. Because Moses, you know, God would, his wrath was just like, he was angry at the people, and Moses would always just try to intervene and try to calm God down and just be like, you know, go easy on them, Lord. And he would just, he was a great advocate for the people. Look at verse 32 and you see this here. Yet now if thou wilt forgive their sin, and if not, Blot me, I pray thee, out of the book which thou hast written. Moses is saying, take me. Moses is saying, blot me out, Lord. You know, don't, you know, come down on these people so hard. But look at what the Lord says to Moses. So the Lord is not going to blot Moses out of the book of life because Moses is saved and God is not going to blot out the saved out of the book of life. We've already seen that. Look at verse 33. And the Lord said unto Moses, whosoever has sinned against me, him will I blot out of my book. Now, what the Bible is saying here, it's not saying anybody who sinned is going to get removed from the book of life. It's saying, God is specifically saying these people that worship the golden calf, they are, they're being going to be blotted out. And then as we see, God just, he basically goes in and he kills um, the people that worship the golden calf in the following chapters. But God basically says he's taking them out, he's blotting them out of the book of life. Turn to Revelation chapter 13. Turn to Revelation chapter 13. So we see that in the book of life, we see so far 
that the saved are in the book of life and the saved will not be removed from the book of life. We see that God says, no, 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 I'm not going to take out your name, Moses, but I'm going to blot out the names of the people that worship the golden calf. So we see the saved are in there and they won't be removed. All right, this kind of backs up eternal security in the Bible. All right, once you're saved, you're always saved. So look, remember, you're going to see, this is why the book of life doctrine is so important, is because you'll see that it just backs up and it fits perfectly with the true gospel. And that's what I'm going to prove to you this morning. Go to Revelation chapter 13. Revelation chapter 13. Look at verse number 7. Revelation chapter 13, verse number 7. So we're talking about, um, in Revelation chapter 13, we're talking about the Antichrist, the Antichrist, who's now made this, uh, he's made this one world government, he's made this one world power, and he's, you know, he's basically going to turn against the saints, the saints being those who are saved, those who have believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and are saved. And in verse number 7, we see this, you know, the abomination of desolation where the, he's going to set up this image in the temple and he's going to require people to take this mark in their right hand or in their forehead, but the saved aren't going to do it. You know, the Bible says that people that believe on the Lord Jesus Christ are not going to take the mark of the beast. Look at verse number 7 of Revelation chapter 13. And it was given unto him to make war with the saints. This is the Antichrist. And to overcome them. That just means like he's going to win. Like he's going he's to be killing them. He's going to be, you know, having a physical war with the saints. And he's go it's not going to go well for the saints. They're going to be physically killed in this time. And power was given him over all kindreds and tongues and nations. Meaning this is where people come up with the, the one world government right here. Is because he had power over the whole world. All nations. All tongues. All kindreds. That means just every nation in the world. He has, he has power. Verse number 8. And all that dwell upon the earth shall worship him. Everybody? Whose names, what? Whose names are not written in the book of the life of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world. So now, that, here's what you need to understand. There's not, two, there's not different books of life. Because people will go out and they're, oh, that's the book of the life of the Lamb. That's the Lamb's book of life. And all this confusion. No, there's one book of life. It's talking about the book of life, meaning it belongs to the Lamb. Who is the Lamb? Jesus Christ, God. It's talking about this is God's book of life. So the last phrase of verse number 8 there, of the Lamb slain from the foundation of the world, is talking about Jesus Christ. Meaning, what do you mean Jesus was slain from the foundation of the world? It means that Jesus was not created. Jesus is the creator of the world. The word of God always existed. Jesus was just the word become flesh. He was just manifest in the flesh 2,000 years ago. But it was always the plan for Jesus Christ to come to this earth and to redeem mankind. That was always the plan. When? From the foundation of the world. God had the whole plan the whole time. So God didn't just come up with this 2,000 years ago and be like, oh man, it's like we got to do something. No. The lamb was slain from the foundation of the world, meaning that was always the plan. All right? You have to understand that, you know, God is eternal. God is eternal, and he's eternal in both directions. He's eternal that way forever in the future, and he's eternal in, in the past. You're like, I, that's hard for me to wrap my head around. Well, you know, God is, his ways are higher than our ways. All right? So he's eternal in both directions. So in Revelation chapter 13, we see that people's names there are certain people's names that are not in the book of life. And these people in Revelation chapter 13 are people that are still alive. Now, this also matches up with doctrine that you're not going to hear everywhere today. But this is the doctrine of, you know, that you could become reprobate. That you could become rejected by the Lord while you're still breathing. You're not going to hear that in a lot of churches today, but that's what the Bible says. All right? That's what the Bible says in Romans 1 many other places in the Bible, that's what the book of life teaches in Revelation chapter 13, that there could be people that are still alive that are removed from the book of life. All right? Now you say, well, maybe they could be added back in. Well, we'll study that. Study that in. All right? Turn to Revelation chapter 14. You say, why aren't these people? It says these people that, you know, whose names, they're going to worship the beast, whose names are not in the book of life. You say, well, why aren't they in the book of life? Why are these people's names in the book of life? Look at Revelation chapter 14 and look at verse number 9. We're getting deep this morning. I'm sorry to do that to you, but we're going we're to study the Bible this morning on, on Sunday morning. Look at verse number 9 of Revelation chapter 14. 
The Bible says, And a third angel followed them, saying with a loud voice, If any man worship the beast and his image, this is talking about, you know, the, the abomination of desolation, the, the image of the beast that was put in the temple, and if any man worship the beast and his image and receive his mark in his forehead or in his right hand, the same shall drink of the wine of the wrath of God, which is poured out without mixture into the cup of his indignation, and he shall be tormented with fire and brimstone in the presence of the holy angels and in the presence of the Lamb. Verse 11, And the smoke of their torment ascendeth up forever and ever, and they have no rest day or night who worship the beast and his image, and whosoever receiveth the mark of his name. No saved person will receive the mark and worship his image. That's what the Bible tells us. Thus we can conclude those who are not saved, those who take the mark, they are blotted out of the book of life at that point. All right, this is talking about eternal damnation for these people. And these people are not saved in Revelation chapter 14. Now look, Many people, I mean, you think about the end times, the mark of the beast, the Antichrist, the one world government. He's going to make war with the saints. But we know with, I mean, we're going to get into, you know, just to go off a little bit here on the end time stuff. We know that God is going to seal 144,000 in their foreheads and send them down to the earth in the wrath of God during that time after the rapture. So he's going to take all the saints all the saved people up in the rapture, then he's going to seal 144,000 and send them to the earth to witness to people during the wrath of God. So if you combine what I'm teaching you about the book of life with the fact that God's going to send these people to the earth to witness to these people, it means not everyone's going to be reprobate, rejected on the earth, meaning there's going to be a lot of unsaved people that don't take the mark of the beast. There's going to be a lot, just a lot of people that are just like, no, I'm not doing that. <laughs> you know, I mean, I know Matthew 24, 24 says, you know, if it would be possible, there's going to be false Christs that arise, and if it would be possible, you know, even the elect would be, but it's not possible. The elect won't be confused by the Antichrist, but there's also, it's just, that's just talking about how convincing the Antichrist is going to be, all right? But there's going to be a lot of people that don't take the mark of the beast that are just not saved, and they just don't want to do that which is those are the people that are going to have a chance to still be saved. Turn to Revelation chapter 17. That's just kind of a side note. Let's go back to the book of life. So we see that the saved are in the book of life, and we see that people are, able, people are blotted out of the book of life. Look at Revelation chapter 17. Revelation chapter 17. Look at verse number 6. Revelation chapter 17. Look at verse number 6. The Bible says, And I saw the woman drunken with the blood of the saints and with the blood of the martyrs of Jesus. And when I saw her, I wondered with great admiration, and, and the angel said unto me, Wherefore didst thou marvel? I will tell thee the mystery of the woman and of the beast that carrieth her, which hath seven heads and ten horns, and the beast that thou sawest was and is not, and shall ascend. This talk, again, talking about the Antichrist, how he will die and like you know come back, and shall ascend out of the bottomless pit, and go into perdition, and they that dwell on the earth shall wonder whose names, they will dwell on the earth, will wonder who, which people, whose names are not written in the book of life from the foundation of the world. That's not saying, that's not talking about the names, it's talking about the book of life was written again. The book of life is from the foundation of the world, meaning that's where it came from, meaning the book of life, it wasn't written, you know, a thousand years ago. It wasn't written at this time. The book of life was written from the foundation of the world. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. Turn to Revelation chapter 20. So we see the book of life was written from the beginning. The book of life was eternal from the foundation of the world. Look at Revelation chapter 20. Revelation chapter 20, look at verse number 14. The Bible says, and I've kind of already read this to you, but let's read it again. It says, And death and hell were cast into the lake of fire. This is the second death. And whosoever was not what? was not written in the book of life, was cast into the lake of fire. So, if you are not in the book of life, if you are not in the book of life after your physical death, you are going to end up in the lake of fire. That's what the Bible is saying here. Look at Revelation chapter 21. Basically, if you're not in there after the first, your physical death, you are going to hell. 
That's what the Bible is teaching here. Look at verse number 21. But look, we see that the saved are in there, all right? We see that the saved are in there and that God will not remove the saved from the book of life. Look at Revelation chapter 21. Look at verse 22. Revelation 21, and look at verse number 22. The Bible says, And I saw no temple therein, for the Lord God Almighty and the Lamb are the temple of it. And the city, this is talking about the new Jerusalem, had no need of the sun, neither of the moon, to shine in it, for the glory of God did lighten it, and the Lamb is the light thereof. And the nations of them which are saved shall walk in the light of it, and the kings of the earth do bring their glory and honor into it. So it's saying that, you know, the, the, the nations, it's talking about nations of them which are saved. So the people that are saved are going to be in the new Jerusalem. And the gates of it shall not be shut at all by day, for there shall be no night there. And they shall bring the glory and honor of the nations into it. Now look at verse number 27. And there shall in no wise enter into anything that defileth, neither, the whatsoe neither whatsoever the, that worketh abomination, or maketh a lie, but they which are written in the Lamb's book of life. So here we see again that, you know, the people that are written in the book of life are going to be saved, they're going to be in heaven, they're going to be part of that first resurrection, they're going to be ruling and reign, reigning with Jesus Christ, and they're going to end up in the New Jerusalem here, equating the saved to those being in the book of life. Go one chapter over to Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22. Revelation chapter 22, look at verse number 18. Revelation chapter 22, look at verse number 18. For I testify unto every man. This is how God ends the Bible, by the way. <laughs> I mean, this is such a, how, do you, how do you end a book like the Bible? You know, this is how God ends the Bible, all right? Look at the verse number 18. This, is, this will explain to you, by the way, if you're not sure why we're King James only, this will explain to you these few verses right here. Look at verse number 18. For I testify unto you, every man that heareth the words of the prophecy of this book, if any man shall add unto these things, God shall add unto him the plagues that are written in this book. And if any... now. Underline these two words. If you write in your Bible, underline these two words in your Bible. If any man shall take away from the words of the book of this prophecy, God shall take away his part out of the book of life and out of the holy city and from the things which are written in this book. This book meaning, you know, the Bible. So God is saying, God is literally saying here, anybody that he covers both things. He said, anybody that adds to my word, and anybody that takes away from my word, they're done. He's like, I'm, I'm, I'm taking away their part out of the book of life. How many times have I read you a verse this morning where God added someone to the book of life? Zero. The book of life was written from the foundation of the world. We see that the saved are in the book of life. We know that. The saved will never be removed. The saved will never be removed from the book of life. But then we see here in Revelation chapter 22, it says, any man. It says, if any man shall take away from my, if any man shall take away the words from the Bible that I have said, I will take away his part from the book of life. What does that tell you? Every man's name starts in the book of life. That's what this tells you. Every single person who has ever lived on the earth or ever will live on the earth is in the book of life. He starts there. But there's certain things that you can do where God will take away your name out of the book of life while your heart is still beating on this earth. And this is exactly what Romans 1 teaches. Because what does Romans 1 teach when God gave them over to a reprobate mind? God gave them up, the Bible says. What did they do? What did they do before that? They turned on God. They hated God. And more specifically in Romans 1, before he gave them up and gave them over to a rejected mind and a reprobate mind to do all those unnatural things, and we see all the things like homosexuality and all these vile things that we see today, God says God gave them over to that. Why? Because they changed the truth of God into a lie. It's exactly what Revelation chapter 22 says. Every man starts in the book of life. Every person's name is in the book of life, and God only has an eraser. 
That's how it works, folks, and it's crystal clear in the Bible. This is the irony, by the way, about false Bible versions. This is the irony about the hundred and some different Bible versions that you see out there today is that, you know, the, it just the people that wrote those Bibles aren't even saved, the Bible says. The people that went and deleted, you know, dozens of verses from the Bible, the people that went and changed doctrines in the Bible, they're not even saved. Their names aren't even in the book of life. So we see in Philippians chapter 4, we see that the saved are in the book of life. We see that names can be only, that are, we see names blotted out. We see that in Revelation chapter 13. We see that in Exodus chapter 32. We see that in Revelation chapter 22. Now, that combined with eternal security, you know, here come the stupid questions that people will ask, right? Well, what if uh, a saved person takes the mark of the beast, you know? Well, the Bible tells you that's not going to happen. What if a saved person writes their own Bible version? You know, what if a saved person um, like Thomas Jefferson writes their own Bible version and takes all the miracles of Jesus out? Thomas Jefferson wasn't saved. <laughs> I, mean, I don't know what to tell you. If somebody, if somebody goes and does the, the, the are any saved person in this church going to go start writing their own Bible version? I mean, give me a break. It's not going to happen, folks. But people will ask those things, right? But look, Revelation chapter 17 clearly teaches that some people that are still living don't have their names in the book of life. This matches the reprobate doctrine. If your name is not in there after the first death, you're going to hell. That's it. And the Bible says in Revelation chapter 21 that the people in the book of life are clearly those that are them which are saved, it points out. In Revelation chapter 22, it says any man can have his name removed. This tells you that everyone starts in the book of life. And, you know, look, here's, here's the reality of it. Most people, most people are not, you know, rejected by God. Most people who just die in unbelief are at that point going to have their names removed from the book of life. That's the mechanics of how that works, all right? But it's possible, turn to Psalm chapter 69, let's look at a couple more verses. It's possible to have your name removed from the book of life before you're dead, physically, all right? You're not going to hear that from a lot of churches today, but look, we're preaching the whole Bible here, all right? We're just going to tell you, you know, how it is. The Bible is our boss at Hold Fast Baptist Church. Look at Psalm chapter 69. Look at verse number 28. Look at Psalm chapter 69, verse number 28. Let's just look at some other random verses in the Bible and see if this matches up with what we've learned. Look at Psalm chapter 69, verse 28. The Bible says, let them be blotted out of the book of the living and not be written, written with the righteous. What does that teach you right there? This is David talking about people that hate the Lord, people that have turned on the Lord, and, and David's just like, Lord, blot them out of the book of the living. This shows you that the, the, the patriarchs of the Old Testament knew how this worked as well. God's like, you know, just, David's just like, the psalmist just like, blot them out of the book of life. And, you know, why? And not be written with, why? Who's, who's going to end up in the book of life? The, the saved will end up there, all right? Look at Daniel chapter 12. Daniel chapter 12. Look at verse number 1. Daniel chapter 12. Look at verse number 1. And the Bible says in Daniel 12, verse 1, And at the time, at that time, Michael shall stand up, the great prince, which standeth for the children of thy people. And this is talking about, um, this is a great verse talking about the, you know, the, against the pre-trib rapture here, that, that the rapture is going to be after the tribulation, after the greatest tribulation, as Matthew chapter 24 says, and also Daniel chapter 21. It says, and there shall be a time of trouble. What kind of trouble? There's been a lot of trouble for Christians throughout history. And it says a time of trouble such as never was since there was a nation, even to that same time. Meaning, the, the, it's talking about the great tribulation here, saying that that time of trouble will be so troublesome that there will be, it will be the worst time in history to that point. And that matches exactly Matthew 24, where it says, you know, there shall be great tribulation such as not was since the beginning of the world to this time. Meaning, I mean, and if you look at like the martyrs throughout history and how terrible it has been for Christians, you know, by the Romans persecuting the Christians, the Catholics, 
persecuting the Christians and the horrible things that were done. I mean, I've got that book called The Martyr's Mirror. It's literally that thick. And, and you say, it's going to be worse than that? Yeah, it's going to be the worst time in, in history. That's how bad the Great Tribulation will be, and that is going to be when the Antichrist is hunting the Christians. That is going to be when the, the Antichrist is you know, coming after those that didn't take the mark in their right hand or their forehead. Look at verse, uh, the rest of verse 1. And it says, And that time thy people shall be delivered. Talking about the rapture there. Every one that shall be found, what? Written in the book. Meaning, the saved. So God's going to come and, and, and get the saved. Look at verse... Um, well, you don't, don't turn to Matthew 24. I just kind of quoted it for you. But look, here's the conclusion, folks. Here's the conclusion. The book is written from the foundation of the world. That means it was already written. That's written as I speak to you now. All God uses on this book is an eraser. All right? And we know that from what I've read you, I said the saved, they can't be removed. That matches perfectly with the doctrine of eternal security that the Bible teaches throughout. And also, the unsaved, they can be removed. The unsaved can be removed. But look, this doesn't fit with Calvinism. This idea, this is why this doctrine is so important that we study this, because it doesn't fit with this idea that God chose some people to be saved, and he chose some people to be damned from the beginning of the foundations of the world. And that's what Calvinism teaches. Calvinism, this, this idea of, you know, predestined salvation is, is, it goes against the Bible in so many different places, especially with this doctrine of the book of life. Because look, think about it this way. If Calvinism was correct, and God literally created some people to be damned and some people to be saved, why would anyone have to be removed? I mean, was there a mistake in the book? Did God make a mistake? Or, or what's going on? It doesn't fit at all. It would just be correct. It would just be correct. There would be no blotting required if Calvinism was true. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. You certainly could not believe in eternal security and believe in Calvinism at the same time. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2, and I'll explain to you why. Turn to 1 Timothy chapter 2. And by the way, when Calvinists talk about the perse perseverance of the saints, they are not talking about eternal security. What they are saying is, oh, see, if, if I'm a Calvinist, if I'm a Calvinist and I believe that, you know, I've, I've believed on the Lord Jesus Christ and I'm saved because I've trusted in Jesus, and, but I was chosen from the beginning of the world, the Calvinists will teach that you can never really know if you're saved. Because if I stop going to church and I stop doing the, the things that God wants me to do in my life, then the saints will persevere, see? The saints will never stop doing those works and never stop doing those things. That is not what the Bible teaches. But then I'll start, I'll just, the, the Calvinist would say, oh, I was just never saved in the first place. Because he got backslidden and he fell out of church and he started, you know, falling into the same sins that he used to do. So he was never the chosen, is what the Calvinist will say. All right? But look, it's possible for a Christian to get backslidden. It is possible for a Christian to get saved and then just not do the works that God wants them to do in their life. Happens all the time. Should Christians do that? No. But they do it all the time. But guess what? Your salvation has nothing to do with your works. Nothing. Not even 1%. So look at 1 Timothy chapter 2 and verse number 1. Let's read this and let's see if it matches this idea that everyone's name starts in the book of life. Look at 1 Timothy chapter 2. Look at verse number 1. I exhort thee, therefore, that first of all, supplications, prayers, intercessions, and giving of thanks be made for all men, for kings and for, that are, for all that are in authority, that we may lead a quiet and peaceable life in all godliness and honesty. For this is good and acceptable in the sight of God our Savior. So we see this kind of this reference to all men, all that are in authority. But look at this. Talking about God our Savior, semicolon. God our Savior wants what? It says who, that's God our Savior that we're talking about, the who, will have all men to be saved. You know what that means when it says, God our Savior will have all men to be saved? That means, that doesn't mean that God is going to force everyone to be saved. What that means is that God's will 
is that all men would be saved. This is the brass tacks of it, folks. The book was written from the foundation of the world and every man's name in there, and it's God's will that all of those men would believe on the Lord Jesus Christ. Will that happen? No, it will not happen. But that's not God's will. That's the will of the men that were blotted out of the book of life. God doesn't want people to go change his word. God doesn't want people to change the truth of God into a lie. God doesn't want people who are not saved to just go and just, just defy him and just turn against him and hate him. God doesn't want that. It's God's will that all men would be saved. Will that happen? No. But all have a chance. All have a chance. And that chance all start with two things in Romans chapter 1 and Romans chapter 2. All start, and we're going to talk in detail about this tonight on science and the Bible, but all start with the creation. We can all see it. We can all see I don't care where you were born. I don't care if you were born in South, South America, Australia, Russia, the United States. All can look around and see the creation. And what we're going to talk about in detail tonight, all can look around. And look, you have to close your eyes to miss it. All can look around and see the order of things that were put here. You have to deny the order. You have to deny the order of the creation in order to not see God. You have to close your eyes to it. And then in Romans 2.15, it says, he wrote the law in everyone's heart. This is how people, you know, some, you know, tribe in the you know, Amazon jungle or whatever, they just know that murder is wrong. They just know that certain things are wrong. Why? Because God wrote the law in every man's heart. That's why. And then he wants them to see that law in their heart, and he wants them to seek the Lord. And they'll find the Lord. He promises that in Matthew chapter 7. Look at uh, John 3, 16. Again, so all men, God, it's will, God's will that all men to be saved. That's why John 3, 16 says, whosoever. It says whosoever. Look, if Calvinism was true, he couldn't say that. You couldn't say whosoever. It'd be so, whosoever believeth in him should not perish as long as they were chosen. That's not what it says. It says, whosoever should believeth in him shall not perish. I mean, that's just, that's it. If you trust 100% in Jesus Christ and not yourself, not some other God, not some false belief, if you repent, meaning you turn from that false belief to only trusting in Jesus, the Bible says you're saved and that's it. And that's what God wants. That's the will of God. Romans 1, Revelation chapter 13, Revelation chapter 24. It's just, it's talking about how people can be taken out before they even die. If predestination meant that God only chose certain people from the foundation of the world, it would not be necessary to remove anyone. Look, folks, I mean, God has, in this sense, that God wrote everyone in the book of life, God has chosen everyone in that sense. It's just that not everyone will realize their destiny that God wants for them. That's what the Bible is teaching here. Not every, and look, and here's another thing. You know, the, the total depravity of the tulip doctrine, not everyone's a reprobate either. <laughs> Some people are just not, the vast majority of people are just not saved. You know, they're not rejected by God. One more comment on predestination. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. And this goes along, this, this will, this is kind of a measuring stick, I'll give you this as we close, for any false doctrine. All right, turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Turn to 2 Corinthians chapter 11. 2 Corinthians chapter 11. Predestined, the word predestined, it just means to make firm or to, you know, um, to determine beforehand, which doesn't that match the book of life as we're learning it this morning? It's just, it was determined that all names are in it. It was determined that all names were in it. Now, there's this popular website out there. There's this popular website out there, and this, I'm going to kind of try to steer you away from Bible commentary. I know that most people don't read Bible commentary in this church, but I want to show you that just the danger of Bible commentary. There's this popular website out there called Got Questions. And it's, if you Google, like, you know, uh, a Bible verse, a lot of times, like, this will come up as, like, a, a secondary result. And, 
This Got Questions website, they are Calvinist, meaning they believe that God has chosen certain people and he has chosen certain people to be damned and chosen certain people to be saved. And I want to um, just give you the Got Questions answer on how, you know, we could, how could salvation be by believing on the Lord Jesus Christ and also that God chose certain people? How could those two things match? I'm going to read you the answer um, from this website. Here's the question that's, answer, that's asked to God questions. If God is choosing who is saved, doesn't that undermine our free will to choose and believe in Christ? Here's the answer, all right? First of all, yes, it does. That's the real answer, okay? But here's the answer from this website. Somehow in the mystery of God, right away you need to close the book right there, all right? Somehow in the mystery of God, you're turning to 2 Corinthians 11. Somehow in the mystery of God, predestination works hand in hand with a person being drawn by God and believing unto salvation. God predestines who will be saved, and we must choose Christ in order to be saved. Look, folks, that deletes free will. That deletes free will, right? Any logical person can understand that. Free will is taught throughout the entire Bible. The, the gospel depends on free will, folks. You cannot let go of free will. And then he ends this. He says, oh, the depths of the riches and wisdom and knowledge of God. He's, he's basically what he's saying is like, we can't understand it. He's saying, we can't understand it. Look, folks, there's some things that are hard to understand in the Bible. End times prophecy, the Bible says we look through a glass darkly. Revelation, end times prophecy, a lot of these things, they're kind of hard to understand. Not impossible, but they're kind of hard to to understand because God doesn't really want us to know all the answers. He kind of wanted us to see through a glass darkly. Let me tell you something. The gospel is not one of these. The gospel is not hard to understand. That's why we'll go out soul winning and an eight-year-old will get saved. The gospel is so simple, the Bible says that a child can understand it. Look at verse number three. Second Corinthians chapter 11 and verse number three. The Bible says this, it says, but I fear lest by any means. This is Paul writing to this church, and he's like, I'm afraid for you. He's like, I'm afraid for you, because people are complicating things. People are coming in here, and they're like Jordan Peterson. They stand up, and they say all this stuff, and everyone's like, man, that guy's smart. What do you say? I don't know, because he said nothing. They stand up there, and people are experts at this. People are experts. They get up and they talk and, and you just walk away being like, that guy's smart. What did he just teach you? I don't know. I'm not smart enough to understand anything that that guy can say. You know what a good teacher is, by the way? A good teacher is something that can make something complicated simple. That's a good teacher. There's a lot of times when I, when I, uh, when I preach, a, I'm going to preach a complicated sermon. I mean, this, this is kind of complicated. And I'm just like, God, I pray that I can take this complicated subject and just make it clear and just teach it simply from your word. But let me tell you something, folks. The gospel is not one of these doctrines. Let's continue reading. I fear, lest by any means, this, through the serp as the serpent beguiled Eve through his subtlety. It's saying, look, subtlety is always bad. Subtlety is secrecy. Subtlety is trickery. Subtlety is doing things in a not upfront, honest way. He's saying, so your minds should be corrupted from the simplicity that is in Christ. You know what's simple, folks? You know what's simple? Here's what's simple. Realizing that, that we're all sinners and because of our sins, we deserve to go to hell. God sent his son to pay the price for our sins. He bare our sins in his own body. And all you have to do is believe on, or as the Bible defines that in Ephesians chapter 1, trust on Jesus. 100% or zero. If you trust and put your trust on Jesus, in a moment you're saved. And you're sealed by the Holy Spirit, the Bible says, forever. It's eternal life. It's not five-year life. It's not two-year life. It's not two-week life. It's eternal life. The Bible says once you trust and believe on Jesus Christ, you're saved and that's it. You know what? That's very simple. You know what's complicated? You got to come to church here three times a week to go to heaven. You got to get baptized by me to go to heaven. You better bring your babies here and have me sprinkle them if you want them to go to heaven. You better do all these different things 
in this order and all that, you know, you better, you know, look this way. Look, God gives us all these commandments he wants us to do, but none of them have anything to do with being saved except trusting on Jesus. That's it. That's all, folks. It's very simple. Just remember the Philippian jailer. What did they say to the Philippian jailer? He brought them out and says, sirs, what must I do to be saved? And they're like, well, how much time do you have? They said, believe on the Lord Jesus Christ and thou shalt be saved. That's it. That's all. So look, when an interpretation of the Bible just contradicts clear, simple scripture, meaning the simplest thing in the gospel, we must reject it. And look, it's a, it's a huge red flag when somebody tells you something's a paradox. Something can't be understood. I, I was raised Lutheran, it, it very, very similar. You know, how can I be assured of my salvation? Because the Lutheran believes you can lose your salvation. How can I be assured of my salvation if I can lose my salvation? And the Lutheran answer on their website, it's right there for everyone to see, is literally, it literally says, it's a paradox. I'm like, look, you got to walk away from that stuff. It's false doctrine. The Bible says that salvation, turn over to 1 Corinthians chapter 14, just a couple of paragraphs, or a couple of chapters back in your Bible. 1 Corinthians chapter 14, look at verse number 33. Well, you know, how can I be assured of my salvation if I can lose it? Um, both are true. No, wrong. The Bible says in 1 Corinthians chapter 14 and verse number 33, it says, for God is not the author of confusion, but of peace, as in all churches of the saints. Any false teaching will run into problems with the Bible, and ultimately problems with logic. And look, the main one with the book of life, the main thing that you need to understand with the book of life is names are only removed, never added. And every man starts in them. Certain acts, turning on God, you know, removing, you know, taking the mark of beast, or the beast, removing his word, all these things. Look, those things will get you, fa uh, those things will get an unsaved person fast-tracked to becoming a reprobate, is what those things will do. And that's what the Bible is teaching. And this matches perfectly with everything that we find in the Bible. And it preserves the simplicity of Christ. It preserves the simplicity of the gospel. We just have to remember, like, you know, it's important to know the Bible. It's important to know the Bible so when somebody's teaching a bunch of false doctrine, you can say, yeah, that's wrong. You know, but look, all you really need to know is the simplicity of the gospel, and you'll see that some, a lot of these, you know, a lot of these doctrines, a lot of these false teachings, they break the gospel. You know, they turn the gospel into a paradox. We must reject these things. Everybody starts in the book of life. God, is, his will is that every man would be saved. His will is that every man would believe on his son. It's, 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 I don't, unfortunately, most people are not going to be saved, but that's not God's fault. And he's told us to go out there and carry that gospel to people. Because look, what a sad thing if somebody would receive it and nobody knocks on their door and nobody teaches them how simple it is to go to heaven. All right? And then they can have their name, you know, forever in the book of life. All right, that's the book of life, folks. It's a super important doctrine. It's a little bit complicated, but if you make sure that, you know, you're just reading the Bible and just listening to what the Bible says, we can just, you know, we can see how the Bible just matches perfectly with itself. That's how you know, by the way, God wrote the Bible. I mean, we're reading Old Testament, we're reading New Testament. These guys didn't know each other. <laughs> These 40 different authors, they didn't know each other, yet every single thing matches the New Testament, matches the Old Testament, because the Holy Spirit wrote the whole thing. Let's bow our heads and have a word of prayer.